is Ernest Cremo. I um, was born in New York in 1926. I'm one of four brothers. I'm the second oldest. At the age of seven, my parents decided to send me and my older brother to Greece to get educated in Greece. And we stayed there uh, until the Germans come into Greece in 1941. Uh, we didn't do anything because we were not at war at that time and I was an American citizen, so I was fine. But then uh, three days after December 7 happened, Hitler declared war against the United States. So uh, because we were American citizens, the police stations bro kept broadcasting and the papers to report to the police stations. They would send us to uh, Germany. Um, my brother had a connection, who had a connection to the last American uh, consulate person in Athens. He was trying to wind up all the affairs. And he, uh, at the time, the German commandant, command, commander of Athens and the Italian, they were disagreeing who is the big top Mahatma. So uh, he went through the Italian and he arranged to have a military Italian airplane. We flew out of Athens at 4 o'clock in the morning. What was that like going through your head thinking that the well, Germans are it was, I was up? very scared uh, because uh, the trip started about 3 in the morning. I, we lived with an uncle and my uncle uh, woke us up about 2-3 o'clock in the morning and we, had, we lived in the outskirts of Athens and uh, it took us about maybe 2-3 hours to going through dark spaces we had to hide every time we heard motors because the Germans had a lot of motorcycle patrols around. It took us about, uh, we got there maybe five o'clock or something in the morning. And I was scared shitless, to tell you the truth. So, excuse my English, but no, no, I, I was 14 years old and I really didn't know everything. Um, my brother was uh, an academician uh, and uh, very smart. So he, he handled everything. He was like my father. No, he was only a year and a half older than I am. So uh, we, we got on the bus in the middle of Athens to took us to the airport. Nobody spoke. It was about seven people in, in, the, in the bus who came all the way to the New York with us. And so we went, we flew to Rome, stayed there for four months, I think, three months, something like that, until the, the arrangements were made. So one day they told us, oh, but while we were in Rome, we were told to not leave the city limits of Rome because we would lose that special protection we had of being in Rome because German soldiers were all over the place. I mean, if they could have hit, hit me on the head and taken me away, we wouldn't know the difference. But anyway, uh, finally, about three months later, the, we, they, they told us we were ready to leave. We got on a, on, a, on a train in Rome, which was all boarded up, and uh, went up the boot of Italy. And we didn't know we were going straight into Germany because nobody was telling us nothing, or are we going to turn towards France, you know, and go towards Spain and Portugal? Did you speak the language at all? I spoke uh, Greek only. My brother spoke both languages. So you could kind of understand what was going oh, yeah, on. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But they were not telling us anything until one night we stopped and uh, we didn't know where we were. The board, the boards were, the plane, the windows were boarded, but you could see a crack once in a while. So when it stopped, we couldn't see nothing. We didn't know nothing. But one side was totally dark, the station was the other side. Once it started moving, somebody uh, called out Marcel, Marcel's. It's a, it's a seaport uh, in southern France. Marcel, I don't know how to pronounce it in English territories. But anyway, so we knew that we were going towards Spain and Portugal. Portugal being the destination to get a ship to go across country. And we were always scared because we didn't know what, what was happening. Nobody would tell us nothing. So the train jumped, uh, took off again, and then I can't tell you how long it took, two days maybe, to reach the France-Spanish border. It was maybe three, four o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden it started slowing down and stopped total darkness. We couldn't see nothing with this side. It turned out to be we had just crossed the French border into Spain. We were free. And uh, there was a coffee shop there. We had butter for the first time in six months or something. It was very nice. We had a very good breakfast, which is a surprise. It was not in an in a itinerary, but the American embassy did it. The people there working, they 
collected the monies and they bought us friends. Anyway, we went all the way to Portugal. In Portugal, we got the biggest surprise because when we got off the train, the bus took us two hours to get to the hotel and we see ocean. So we thought, well, maybe the ship is here, we're going to take off. We wound up in a very aristocratic hotel, which turned out to be, during the peacetime, was for aristocrats or nobility. So when you walk into your apartment, you got three, four rooms, humongous rooms. Go this, go that, and, you know, very, very, I was lost. I mean, uh, and we stayed there about two weeks. And then uh, the ship came to Portugal to pick us up. And that was a hairy thing because when we were leaving, we knew what the U-boats were doing. You know, they were, by mistake, sinking a lot of, a lot of uh, ships. So this whole time, there's no way to relax. You're just stressed. It was not relaxed, but we didn't know. We didn't yeah. know, you know. And um, the plane was very lit, I'm, I'm sorry, the ship, with a cross, red cross. So the U-boats don't mistake us for somebody, you know. But, you know, they're, they're human beings. If they hate us, one little torpedo, oops, sorry, my fingers, stood, you know. Anyway, um, I'm, I don't remember how many days it took us to cross the Atlantic. At night, we were very worried, very worried. Finally, and this is odd because Memorial Weekend is coming up this weekend, right? Mm -hmm. We arrive outside of New York Harbor, Memorial Weekend. But we Americans, I mean, you know, we were ne never ready for a war. We, were n we could not get into the harbor of New York because the stevedores or the longshoremen would not work on that weekend, Memorial Weekend. It's a holiday. And nobody wanted to pay them triple time or something. So we had to stay outside in the open sea. And everybody said, well, this is a night. We're going to swim home, <laughs> you know. It was really something. But nothing happened. What was it like setting foot on American soil? Oh, again? I'm talking about very, very emotional. Ellis Island. <clears throat> There's a place we went. You know, you know where Ellis Island is. And there were I remember ladies and with the Red Cross ladies giving us coffee, donuts or something. We were waiting for somebody to pick us up and we didn't know who it was gonna be, you know? Yeah. It's very right. emotional, very emotional. Did you have uh, have you talked to your parents that were in America still? No. Um, when we escaped from Greece and arrived in Rome the American consulate in Rome, actually, actually it was the Swiss, the Swiss embassy took over the American response, and they telegraphed to my dad that we're here, that we were free. Yeah. Okay. That was, uh, but then we worried about going across the Atlantic was really a quirker. Probably that was the worst part. Mm -hmm. The train is going to go to Germany or it's going to make a left, and you don't know when it's making a left in the train. It's not like a car or a bus, you know? Yeah. And then we waited, who's going to pick us up? Well, we didn't have c uh, cell phones or nothing, you know. The planes were all, there no jet planes. So anyway, my dad's brother came and got us. We stayed in their house for about a week, I think. Then we got onto, uh, there used to be another, uh, not Greyhound, Santa Fe Trailways. They took us across country. We had one incident going across, but in the morning we stopped someplace for coffee or something. I was fast asleep. My brother was a sleepwalker, and nobody knew that. I didn't even know that. No, maybe I was. I didn't know that. Anyway, nobody said nothing. And as everybody got off the bus to go to the cafeteria, my brother started walking out in the desert. And nobody, somebody saw him, and he called the driver, and he chased after him, and he got him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That should have that should that should have prevented him from going in the military, mm. because walking, you know, he could have walked right into the Japanese airlines. Hey, how are you doing? But, yeah. So anyway, but we arrived in Los Angeles. The mayor of Los Angeles was here. I somewhere I have a paper of him and us, May, May, Mayor Barron. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I remember when we got to uh, the United States was I think. The first week of June, Memorial Weekend, we in New York, but uh, in June or July, whenever the Marines invaded Guadalcanal, because I remember on, on a Sunday paper, my two younger brothers were reading the paper, and I saw the headline Marines. Of course, I didn't know where Guadalcanal was, but I remember that, that thing. Uh, 
And as it turned out, my brother gets killed in the next island right next over there. He, two year, two year, he, he died uh, before he was 22, I guess. Yeah. So where, where were you uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked? I was in Athens, Greece. And I, I neglected to say that uh, a week before Easter, the Germans came into Athens. We were living in the northern suburb of Athens. So the Germans come in through there. I didn't know nothing. Nobody was outside on that Sunday. And a German tank stops from a big intersection, turret opens up, a guy comes in with his blood, uh, gets out with a black uniform, you know, had the skulls here. And I was scared. I was, he goes, I don't know what the hell. And he shows me his canteen. He wants water. So I showed him a house that has a faucet outside. He got up, filled it up. Started walking by, he was looking, he was a scout for the German tanks coming up. Got in a tank, took off for the, for the center of Athens. And that's how Germany, that's how Greece was occupied. Which is a very uh, uh, interest, interesting historical thing here that I know, and maybe you know this already, but because I've studied the Second War a lot, I mean, it's, that's my pastime. Hitler was going to invade Russia in May of 1941. And because Italy, who invaded Greece first, couldn't beat us, couldn't beat the Greeks, he, he held up invading Russia to invade Greece and help his friend out. So when he inv started to invade Russia, it was already September, October, and you know what happened with the Russian snow. And that, really, that could have really changed the war, you know, it's a lot. Little things sometimes change the whole thing. And so the thing, is, the main thing is when my brother took a test for UCLA, passed the second grade. They put him in a second year, second year. And he had never even finished high school in Greece. But he wanted to be an engineer. He was a studier. I used to play soccer in the street. He used to read the books. But it wasn't, uh, you know, he, he got drafted. He got drafted. So I went in right after him. He died uh, March 4th, March 10th, and I went in May. Okay. I just walked away from the school and didn't go back. What made you? What made you decide well, to go I, in? Yeah, I would just wanted to kind of revenge or something, you know. Why wait till August? You know, I couldn't. I couldn't study, so it turned out to be okay, I guess. What made so, you choose the Navy? Um, I, his last letter to me, to my my brother, his name was Bill, uh, said to me, uh, and he must have been in the jungles at the time. It must be messy because you don't see your nose like you're some. When we saw Bungaville, all I saw was green coming out of the ocean. No beach. The damn trees are growing up right all over the place. And he said, uh, Ernie, I know, you, uh, I know you, your time is coming to go in. He said, but I've seen a lot of disappointments. And that kind of put a thing in my mind. He's not happy with the Army, you know. And I had taken ROTC at, at school because I thought I was going to go in the Army. And so I switched to the Navy. And my other two brothers went in the Navy. But the thing is, I was, having come from Greece, I was not aware of my location or where I was. I knew I was in Hollywood, California, went to school in Hollywood, but I didn't know nothing. So when I went into the Navy, my dad took me down and signed some papers. And he said, well, you're going to go down to a San Diego Naval Training Base. I don't know where San Diego was. It could have been east, west, or whatever. I, I, there was no, you know, I was kind of a lost kid. Like, a, I was a foreigner. You, so, and at the same time, when we when we started training uh, landing, we went to a place called San Luis Obispo, which is uh, north in California, but this side of Frisco. Yeah, I think it's this side. And they had, we trained a landing, and it was a little small, big rock, just like later Iwo Jima had a big, uh, uh, big uh, mountain. Mount Saribachi? Mount Saribachi. So what was it like leaving the comfort of home going to boot camp? Uh, terrible. Terrible. I couldn't swim. So they, when they put me up in a 30 years, a 30 foot stand, instead of jumping with my feet down, I went, ah! Everybody, that, the two guys dived in, the, the guys that were supposed to save you. I passed out. It was a belly flop? It was like a belly flop, yeah. Oh. I just went straight down. Nobody said nothing to me. Everybody knew what they got to do, but I don't know that. I'm a kid from Greece. I, mean, I don't know nothing. I lasted 30 days, I think, of training. 
And I went home. Uh, but I still didn't know. And even when they told me I'm going to San Francisco, I didn't know where San Francisco was. You know, I mean, is it this way or that way or this way? You know, yeah, I was very totally lost. Then they, when they, when we went aboard ship and we parked, we were someplace there, maybe Oakland somewhere. They went on a weekend thing. Where am I going to go for a weekend? I didn't know, you know, how am I going to get back to here? Pier one and pier two, there was nothing. I mean, for me, it was a struggle to get, yeah. So going into, um, was it the Amtraks that you drove? No, I, I, I had, uh, I was on a, what they call an LCVP, okay. landing, landing Vehicle Personnel. It's a, what they call a Higgins boat. Hmm. It had the, the ramp in the front. It's a plywood boat, but it had on this side the uh, steel for the soldiers not to get hit by bullets. But the bottom, the rest was all plywood. So what was that training like? Up okay, they sent me to Coronado for that. Okay. And everything was new to me. I mean, I just didn't, I had to wait for somebody to do something because they were giving instructions and my English wasn't good enough yet to pick it up, you know? Yeah. But uh, the training, I liked the training, it was fun. You said dump in water, a little bit, you know, water. A Coronado over there, Camp Pendleton where the Marines are, a lot of sand over there. We used to, we used to train there a lot in Coronado. Yeah. Then they signed us to the ship. The USS Missoula is a ship, it's what they call a liberty ship. And uh, the people from Missoula, Montana, had a, what they call a liberty drive. They would buy uh, what they call liberty bonds. And that money was enough to buy a ship. You know, Kaiser, Kaiser, Kaiser made those ships. Yeah. And then when I left, I was really lost on the ship. San Francisco, it was all darkened and everything. Man, I was, for me, everything was uh, very hard to, I couldn't, uh, my brother was like a father to me, you know? So I, I kind of lost it, I don't know. So being in an area you don't know, and then on top of that, it's blacked out because they're scared of the Japanese attacking. Everything, everything blacked out, yeah. That had to add another level of stress to everything. Yeah. I was worried because, you know, I used to be a, a stamp collector, but we're going to all these islands that I never heard of, and I thought, well, I knew the world was all the stamps. I had four albums of every, everything you wanted I had. We uh, we went to Honolulu. It was probably January something, fifteen twenty. We were there for a week or something. We picked up the Marines from there, and we knew we were going for an invasion. One stupid asshole jumped over the ship when he were, when we left uh, Hawaii because he wanted to uh, swim to one of the small islands and hide. Well, when you got in the water, the island were way far away. They went and picked, up, picked him up again. So did you have a preference on fighting the Japs or the Germans? Or did you uh, just... I understood the Germans better. Mm -hmm. The Japs were just something... They hadn't done anything to me. Did you... You know what I'm saying? I had no... There were no Japanese in Greece and no Orientals in Greece. Greece is a very religious country. They have churches all over the place, little small ones. Very few blacks that come from Kenya because some Greek monks uh, or uh, what do they call those guys? They go to other countries try to teach their religion. What's the word I'm looking missionary. for? Missionary. What? Missionary. Yeah, missionaries. You know, like the Mormons do, and the, so there are some blacks there. They speak Greek as better as I do, you know. But uh, when we picked up the Marines, I mean, that was scary because now we're going someplace we don't even know. And on, the, on that ship, there's 26 boats, land crew. I think they're 26, I, mine was number 12. And, um, you just don't know what's gonna happen, you know? Finally, about the third day, they told us we're gonna invade Iwo Jima. Well, I don't know, I had no stamps with Iwo Jima because they're part of Japan, you know? So I didn't know nothing. Was that your first experience? That was my first experience. <laughs> Wow. And then, because we had to get into, we got into the boat, there were four crewmen on the boat. I was not the, the coxswain, somebody else. I was one of those two. The ramp was uh, by a wire, it was uncoiled, but there was two hooks to hold it. 
and we had to climb on a gunwale and uh, release that so the ramp can go down. But nobody picked us up, you know. Uh, yeah. And so, but when we, <laughs> there's, I don't know whether you know this, but these land crafts that we had, the boats, they they become in a wave of 10 or 12, and each wave is governed by an ensign, like a second lieutenant of the army. And he, when he goes this way with his flag, we all gun the engines, and you're going, with the land on the beach, you've got to go fast. Otherwise, the waves turn the boat around and damage the, the propeller, and then they're obsolete, you know. So what was it like leaving the darkness of the ship going out into open water to, to the island? It was kind of exhilarating, to tell you the truth. We tried to look over there. I kept looking. All we saw was an island with uh, with a, a Mount Siribaki there. Uh, one of the most interesting things happened later in life. I was reading a book called The Flag of Our Fathers. And in that book, it mentioned my ship, the USS Missoula. The guys that, that raised the flag were on my ship. They could have been in my boat or the next one, who knows? But it's kind of, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, you know, nothing is special, but it is special. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have said goodbye to him, who knows? What, uh, do you remember what wave of the invasion you were on? I was in a third wave. Okay. Uh, the first wave was some kind of an Amtrak. The Marines have some kind of a thing that goes on the land and Amtrak, they call them ducks, I think. Third, uh, third wa uh, wave. Okay. So, so what was it like when dropping that? That was exhilarating. When we, when we gunned the, everybody gunned the, I wasn't dr driving. They were driving, they gunned the inner, so my, it took off, you know. And the bottom goes down deeper <laughs> and the ramp goes up. But there were, I forgot, 26, I think, Marines in there or something. Young people, what a shame. So when you hit the when you hit the beach, when you hit the beach, we unhook the thing, the, the the old hooks there, and the ramp goes down. There's a guy in the back, who's actually the motormatic of the crew, a mechanic, I should say. He's the one that releases the ramp, and they out they go. I mean, it's you gotta have balls to do that. I'm telling you. Yeah. I mean, I was scared. Can you just can you describe kind of? It's very emotional because you you wonder. In fact, before we we pulled out away from the thing, but they called us back because guys got hit. We had to take them take them back to the hospital ship. And I'm looking to see, and I couldn't tell were they on my boat or not. You know, it's kind of a kind of an eerie thing. Eighteen year old guys like me, you know. It's uh, yeah, it's not very nice, not very. Nice. But they are the heroes, the guys that go in there. They know that so some of them are going to get killed, but they go. Me, I'm nothing. I, I pulled out, we pulled away from that beach so fast, man. Because you got to get away from it because the next wave is coming in. What, what was it like coming back to the ship and then getting your your next load of Well, guys? we took back uh, we took back some casualties and we headed for the hospital. There's two three hospital ships that were out 10 15 miles. And we then those boats we are uh, flat, so you know going away, uh, it's kind of seasick. I got seasick a little bit. I didn't smoke, and the guy said, "Okay, Greek, take a smoke. You'll be okay." I took one smoke, <laughs> and I coughed, and I threw the damn key uh, stick away. I I don't like smoking. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. So get, getting the the rest of the guys, so, the, the boats have got to already have. So we we were on the, we were on the, on the sea for five days and nights, no shower, no nothing, because we had to take bring back guns and food and whatever else I wanted. Uh, actually, I, I gotta say we're at peace after the second day, because the the especially the Japs that were hidden in Iraq, Mount Mount Suribaki, they had the cement gate uh, cement doors that were open. And they would just throw away, throw out uh, mortar shells to try to get the boats, because if it hit the boat, we're all goners. We had a life life jacket on and so forth, but in New Jima, the, the there's no beach. The water comes up, and then the, 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 it was a uh, ash. What do you call that? Volcanic ash. Volcanic ash. So for the Marines that dug into foxholes and got into the mouths, it was terrible. Was terrible. I really felt sorry for those guys. I thought I was really glad I was not in the Marine. You know, I really was. I salute them many times. 
One day, I just met one guy the other day. He was a Marine at Recon, I think in Vietnam. Man, I wouldn't want to do that. War is hell, you know that. It's war. It doesn't. It doesn't solve nothing. The countries are still here. Japan is here. We're here. It's a, anyway. We uh, we went there. We we're five days in the water. Then they pulled us away, and the ship got orders to go down to New New Herbides. And my God, I didn't know who New Herbides are. I knew we were going near Australia, but and going down there one day, I don't know, ten o'clock in the morning, the speaker says, on our starboard side, five miles away is Bougainville. That's where my brother got killed, maybe a year before that, you know. All I could see is palm trees coming out of the ocean. Uh, we went down to the Herbides, we picked up the army, and we come back and we uh, made the invasion of Okinawa, April the 1st. That one was not scary for us because we had no bullets coming our way. Uh, the Japs evidently retreated into the hills. They were going to fight the Americans uh, like a war of attrition, you know. And uh, so it wasn't really anything. The kamikaze planes that come over wouldn't bother our boats. They went into the aircraft carriers and the big ships, you know. So what was it like coming in, going from Iwo Jima that was chaos, going into an island that was quiet? It's like a paradise. We're down to New Herbides. They told us not to go ashore because there are man eaters there. Who knows? So we stayed aboard the ship. There were no piers. The ship was out a couple of miles. How long were you in Okinawa? What we about if we're, we're Okinawa? I don't really remember. Probably about ten days or so. They didn't need us, uh, you know. We they just used us to ferry troops and ammunition and everything. Once that's all settled, and then they brought these big L, L, LCSs or LSTs, LSTs, landing ship. Tanks and the tanks come in. The Japs went and hide, they hid in the, in the hills. They just wanted to kill Americans, you know. They, they could do it better there. I could know, yeah. And then uh, we went, after that, we went to the Philippines. And when, we, when the Philippines was freed, August of 1945, we were at a place called uh, Cebu, which was a U.S. naval base. And we were, which we started practicing landing for the invasion of Japan, which was a, it was a program for November the first of '45. Why November? I don't know. It's so cold over there. I mean, do it in the summer, for God's sake, you know. Yeah. But uh, nobody asked me. So. Uh, so with uh, with the Philippines, did you go into Luzon at all? I went. I went to Philippines. I went to the uh, the ship went into Manila. One day after the Japanese had left, and my biggest memory is the there's a river going through Manila. It was full of everything, mattresses, chairs, tables, shit, tanks. I mean, not tanks, cans. It was very dirty. The Japanese had dumped out everything they could. They they destroyed everything they could. Yeah, you know, uh, we had a chance to go ashore, but they, in fact they wanted volunteers to go detached from the ship and go ashore to the Philippines and help them reconstruct. And I said, no, not me. Were you, were you carrying army at that time? Uh, at the time, no. Oh, okay, was, my, my grandfather was at Luzon and he was in the army. Yeah, Luzon is a very famous place. As you know, there's a naval battle. Mm -hmm. This guy, Admiral Halsey, he got tricked by the Japanese and he pulled away his flotilla went up north. So our landing forces on Luzon had no cover. And they, they were trying to tell him to get his ass back here. They kept saying, where is whatever code they had, you know. It was a, one of the mistakes in America and Admiral. I forget, oh, Halsey, Admiral Halsey. Bill. That's why they called Bill Bull. He wouldn't listen to nobody. So after the A-bomb dropped, and I don't know what an A-bomb drop is, but the war was over. Okay. Did you, uh, when, when you were out the sea, did you guys get the, the news about the Indianapolis at all, or...? No, they, I have a book about that. I read the book. It's a, that's a very stupid thing that happened because the captain asked for a destroyer escort. So the destroyer goes ahead, a couple, 10 miles or something. They pick up sound or something. But no, they, they couldn't. And when he got sunk, uh, the Americans picked up the, submar the Japanese submarines uh, thing 
I have sunk an Indianapolis style or type cruiser. Well, it, you know, nobody moved. American didn't move. I believe, I don't know how it was, maybe you know better than I do, maybe 10 days or something, an American patrol vane or whatever airplane went by and he saw guys down there. In the meantime, a lot of sharks and a lot of food eaten, or you know, it's, it's, uh, what a crying shame. Yeah. To to survive the sinking and then have a shark gobble you up. Did you did you hear about that when you were still on your boat, or did you hear about that later? Um, the Indianapolis one. Yeah. I think later. Okay. I don't think I heard it. Uh, we were never go. We never went anyway unescorted. Un un it was always destroyers or cruisers or something. Because we always had troops most of the time. Now from here to Honolulu, of course, we did not. After that, we picked up the Marines. And then when we left Iwo Jima, I think we took some casualty or somebody to New Harbour for rest. That was a place for rest, rest and R&R, &R, you know, recuperation. It was a, a wasted war. Oh, they all are, they all are. You know, in my way of thinking, because I've studied a lot of this, the wars. War is, somebody said war is hell. It's not the hell, it's stupid. It's, sometimes I think it's God's plan, because if no war, nobody gets killed, we'd be bumper to bumper here, I mean elbow to elbow. Come to think, I mean, millions of people. And, and that's some kind of cruel thing, but God knows what he's doing, I believe that. Uh, so what, what, where were you when you heard that the Japanese had officially surrendered? I was in Cebu. We were training in the Philippines. We were uh, pra practicing, and uh, we knew on November 1st we were going to have the go up there. And this is what we, we I was told, that the Japanese were trained. They knew we were, we were going to come to Ijima, I mean to uh, Honshu. Honshu, I think, is one of the big states, uh, the counties or whatever to invade them. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, they train uh, kids. You know these belts that the Arab are doing now, they have something, they can push a button and blow themselves up, kamikaze, they call them harik, yeah, harikaze. Well, those kids were trained to go in the water when that, when when we had this 10, 10 wave of ship boats going in, we were, we were, we couldn't invade them. I mean, we had to go straight going 80 miles an hour, and all I had to do was get in front of the boat. They, uh, I read someplace where Truman was told that uh, one million Americans or one million of the other side would die, two million people the first day. He decided to drop the A-bomb. I don't mean to sound dramatic, but I don't think I'd be here if, because they were blowing up the boats, you know. I, my ship was in, uh, in in Tokyo Bay when they surrendered. We were all looking through binoculars because we brought the Marines into Tokyo Bay before the ceremony, and we had to take it. It was kind of scary because we had to go up to the uh, piers, and we don't know what those people were doing there. You know, Japs were very sneaky guys. You know, they they would they would surrender in battle, and they would have a hand grenade here. That's they were SOBs. But we dropped the Americans, uh, the Marines on the piers. They secured the piers, and then, yeah. So what what was that environment like after they they signed this the surrender? I'm oh, sure. Oh, we was... were we were jubilant. We were we were I mean we were all happy, you know, high fives and whatever. And I didn't know what the high five was at the time. You know, everybody wanted to get back home again, but you know, some somebody had to stay there. A little bit of partying, perhaps. Partying, yeah, yeah. People would go out. A lot of guys would go out. And, go out and drink in the bar, and I'm, I don't drink, and I didn't know much about things at the time. But, because uh, I didn't know how to get back to the ship, you know. It didn't dawn on me I could take a taxi and tell them Peter 7 or 12. <laughs> but it was, it was okay. I grew up fast, I tell you, I grew up fast. They wanted me to stay, the, the, the instance me before I got discharged. He says, aren't you Greek? I said, well, yeah, <laughs> we ever lived there. But uh, it says uh, there's an opening for a cook. If you want to ship over for four years, we'll send you to a cook a baker's school. I said, no, I what? it didn't appeal to me. I wish I had done it. It's good to know how to cook, <laughs> especially here now. 
I got women all over cooking food. A lot of good people here, very nice people. Yeah, so then I got discharged. I got discharged uh, two two years to the day, May May the first. So what was it? What was it like coming home after the, the war is over and you're back in America? And... Yeah, San Francisco is where I got discharged, and I had to take the bus, and I didn't know how to come down here. And there was a guy from L.A. there. There were two, three of them. They were so they were walking down the road to get a bus or whatever, and I just followed them. I didn't know what what to do. When I saw him get on the bus, I got on the bus. Came down to LA. So, do you um, still talk with anyone that you served with? Uh, they're all gone. Okay. They're all gone. Uh, some years ago, maybe, what is now 2000, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I had a little book with everybody on the ship's crew, especially the boat crews, because we're close. I don't know what happened, to, but I called somebody from, from Texas. His name was Jack L. Hawkins. I always remember him. Nice, nice fellow. He was very tolerant with me, not not understanding a lot of things. Good man. I talked to him. I said, "Well, maybe my wife and I will come by someplace." He says, yeah, we'll come back to the ranch. She said, "But the main road, take the main road through and turn that there." Right. <laughs> yeah, so, if you could tell those guys one thing, what would you want to tell them? What guys? Which one? The guys you served with. Good job done. Good job done. They were. They were we had no no um, anti like we have now all this crap on the streets. I uh, I was watching I watched C-SPAN a lot <clears throat> a lot. The chief of staff general for whatever his name was, I heard him say that today. Thirty seven people out of a hundred that apply for the military. That's terrible. When we don't have enough people with gumption. And then my two brothers went in the, in, the, in the Navy. One went into the, oh, the both Korean War. They were very close in age, two years. Yeah. This is the greatest country in the world, my friends. I want you to know that. You know, yeah, it's it's the best. But it's 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 taking a long it's taking a long um, it's taking a different route that the founding fathers. And I think that maybe we have uh, reached the best, and we're going down this way. My father used to tell me that everything has top. How does it make you feel when you see the protest and the people that's what I flag? That's what I want to write to Trump. I want to write a letter to Trump. And if you give me an address, I'll send you a copy of it when I do it. You'll see how I feel. I'm very pro-American, pro-Trump. The last good president was Eisenhower. We had peace, we had no problems. It's a good country to be from. That's why everybody's dying to come here. They don't go to Russia. <laughs> no. So what what would you want future generations to know about your generation? Uh, to appreciate what we've done. And they don't. I have the youngest one telling me, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. You're too old. He says, he told me one day, I'm a, um, a hood. I'm a hood. And I've never heard that. But then I do notice these kids, that they wear this thing, maybe that's a hood they're talking about, I don't know. And without, without weed and whatever else, they, they can't function. The, the schools are at fault. The schools are at fault. They, they, uh, in Greece, for instance, in high school, you take uh, math, algebra, trigonometry. In high school, they don't know what they're doing there. You got to go to college to get trigonometry. That's why when my brother, who was killed, came here, they gave him an entrance test. Trigonometry was nothing for him. Put him in second second year. Had he never gone to Greece, I think he would have never been a soldier. He would uh, a private. He would have been an officer because of his brain, which means he would have been someplace else. But this was his fate, you know. I mean, I, I accept that. God had a will that way. If you could tell your brother one thing, what would you tell him? I don't know.
Sorry. No, please don't be sorry. You never finish high school, and it passed your CLA second second year. And me, I was a dummy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for your service. Yeah. Whenever somebody tells me to have because I'm wearing my hat, I tell them, God bless the USA. It was scary for me, but looking back, the battle of the bulls and some of the big men, these guys. There's a play, there's a battle called uh, Kasserine Pass. I've read a lot about that. Boy. Yeah. Did you guys have any, uh, any fun things you did maybe while you were uh, at doing some r and play football or anything like that? <laughs> Whenever we had r and they would, we would give everybody two beers. <laughs> And they knew I don't drink, so they were all my friends. <laughs> they all wanted the beer. Did you I sell them? Uh -huh. Did you sell them? No, no, no. <laughs> I didn't have enough. <laughs> they were good. You know, they like beer. It's okay. I don't judge people for what they do, to the truth. This guy that was, uh, there's, a, there's a, a picture there with me and another guy that was in Honolulu. He was 44 years old. What he was doing in a boat crew, I don't know. His name was I.V. Hunt. He was an Indian from Oklahoma. And uh, man, he was a good guy. He took me out like a, like a father to a son. Yeah. yeah. You got any questions for him? No, it's listening. It's a, it's a school, the schools are not doing the job here. The, the, I, took, I put four of them through school. The youngest was four. And the oldest was nine, so you understand, in, in Burbank. They, no homework. And one day they would tell me, oh, yeah, we've got finals uh, next uh, week, so there's no homework. That's when you need the homework, stupids. I mean, come on. They, uh, what are you going to do? Right. One, uh, one is in construction, I'm, I'm happy, the other became a cook. The youngest one is out. He's just gone. That's the one who always calls me for money. Looking back on it, is there anything you would change or have done it differently? I probably would have stayed in the Navy 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I come out of the Navy because my dad was a jeweler. He used to make uh, rings and earrings and everything. And I stayed with him for six months. And it wasn't me, you know, I, mean, I just couldn't do that. I would look at the ring and I couldn't tell him whether, yeah, I think it's okay. And he said, no, it isn't okay. <laughs> so his dad, my father, my grandfather was a watchmaker. So I went to a, a watchmaker school under the VA, and I became a watchmaker, which I loved to think of those little things. I went to New York, but there was not enough money in there. Anyway, I wound up in real estate for 40 years, and I was doing okay there. Mm -hmm. Then I married a woman that I, I wish I hadn't seen. That's why I'm out here. You do things and you gotta pay for them. There's a Greek saying, wherever you lay your bed, that's where you're gonna sleep. Mm -hmm. Some people are smarter, making better decisions, I don't know. But this country is not, not on the right track. I know that. I can. The first picture is my mother. And one of my brothers, brother number three, he went in the Navy, his name is Chris. By the way, he's passed away now. And then the next one is my mother with Bill, the one I got killed. And this one here is, where am I? That's me with I.V. Hunt, the Indian guy. And this is the, the man that I told Jack L. Hawkins from Texas. This is me in the back of, back of the house in Hollywood. That's me also. This is the USS Missoula APA 211. And this is me driving the old Higgins boat. 
And I don't remember this guy's name, but he was part of the crew. Uh, where are we here? Uh, this is a picture taken in Greece in 1939. Can you get it from there? Yeah. Uh, all four of us. I'm the second one. And the one across the way is here's the last one, Peter. The first and the third are gone. And here is the four of us in, in Hollywood in the backyard. This is before he went to the army, Bill. And I'm down here. Where did I miss? This is my dad and me. And this is me and my mother. I just got him out of the album. I figured that nobody sees him in the album. Put him up there. Uh, when when the train left France and uh, entered uh, Spain, Spain was neutral then at the time, so we were free from the German oak, so to speak. And he said to me in Greek, "Tos kasame," which means we have escaped. And this was done by the friend of mine from Utah. You know. Um, it, uh, we had butter for the first time. And see, the Germans came into Athens and they printed fake money. And they went into the stores and bought everything up, but it was all paper money. Uh, we, were, we were in Greece uh, six months with the Germans before we, we left. And, and after the two, three days when they emptied all the stores, the only way we can find food, people from the small towns out in the farms and everything would come in and bring in flour, olive oil. Those two things are the main ingredients, you know. And uh, all you had that, either that you trade or gold coins. That's the only way. Otherwise you start to this. That's why when we got on that bus, I looked outside in the front there was a dead horse. Can you show me the picture of you guys in the, from the newspaper? The newspaper. Yes, I can do that. This is a picture when we arrived in Los Angeles <clears throat> from uh, Santa Fe Trailways was the bus company. And this is the mayor of Bauer in Los Angeles, my brother Bill and I. Someplace I had a newspaper, but it's kind of, he did a pretty good job of doing that. Yeah. And then uh, he's, uh, my friend was very nice to do this, as I mentioned before. Yeah, early in the morning, the, uh, a, a week before Easter, Greek Easter, the, the Germans attack uh, come in. I don't know what it was. This is the bus that we walked through the dark to pick up. It wasn't as modern as that, but uh, it, was not. it did the job, got us to the airport. And uh, this is the tank that I saw that morning. This is what the the, the German uh, that were in the tank crews were wore black and had the skull and uh, you know the bones in it and uh, that's why he did that. Uh, I forgot to tell you something. I hope I don't forget it. Uh, when I went back to Greece in 1963, I walked up to the on the same street I lived. My uncle, who was with us, who lived with us, worked as a shoemaker but it passed away. But then uh, I saw the, his boss, the guy that owned the store, and he, but it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. He was sitting outside talking to somebody, politics as usual, with a Greek coffee cup. I, I stood across the street. He, didn't nev I, he never saw me. So I started walking out across to him. Man, I got so emotional that day. And uh, when I got to him, he looked up and said, yes, can I help you in Greek? And I said, you don't remember me? I said, no. I took my glasses off. You know, you remember the two American boys down the street? Well, he got up, hugged me. Good memory. The plane, the plane didn't look that way, but he drew some. I think that's the only picture I have. Oh, this is the, the ship arriving in New York and uh, Statue of Liberty. Hello everyone, my name is Wyatt Roos and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what Patreon is and how you can help support my project. 
Patreon is a monthly private subscription where content is made just for you. Donating even $5 a month gives me the ability to document the true stories of the Second World War and its heroes. You get access to first-hand experiences of the war and what it was really like to be there. When you support this project, you're supporting Unsung Heroes directly to continue my mission. With your support, I'm able to spend more time on meaningful work that will have a positive impact. Join me on Patreon and let's not let our heroes be forgotten. So come on this journey with me and experience the true stories of the Second World War and its heroes. Thank you very much for watching this video. I have to go get ready and do an interview with a Pearl Harbor survivor. And you know what? Why don't you come with me? So I always start off my interviews asking where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor, but you were actually there, weren't you? Right. Right, okay. Right, right aboard the West Virginia. So how did you not only survive Pearl Harbor and World War II, and then also you're, what, 96? 97. 97. So you, how, how did you make it that long? My faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. The power of the Holy Spirit is what guided me in everything I did and said. Wow. Thank you for taking your time out with you me bet. today. I appreciate it. You bet, Wyatt. Follow me on these interviews that will take you to the past through the eyes of these amazing veterans. For full interviews and to donate to Unsung Heroes Project, please visit the link below. Your donations, likes, and shares, and social media support are greatly appreciated. God, we don't know what our fate might be. We only ask that if die we must, we'll die as men would die without complaining or pleading, safe in the feelings that we have done our best for what we know is right. Dear God, watch our over us, our families, watch over us in the fire ahead and with us now as we pray to you. Move out.